Good morning. Again, so glad, glad to have you folks with us as we spend some time in God's Word. Um, thinking a little bit about advice today. Would you rather give advice or take advice? You know, I read a couple of little quips I thought were kind of cute. I'll read one to you here. It says, everyone believes in the golden rule. Give unto others the advice you can't use yourself. <laughs> and I like this one. It says, the trouble with good advice is that it usually interferes with your plans. You know, have you, have you ever um, had somebody ask for your advice and then after you, you think about it long and hard and you give them your advice, you know, they do the exact opposite thing? You know, and that can happen. And did, how does it make you feel? Does it make you feel a little frustrated maybe? I'm, I'm not sure, you know, it, it, it depends. But you know, essentially, this is what the priests and the Pharisees and the scribes and the elders were guilty of in Jesus' day. Now just think with me for a, for a moment here, you know. They, these people were in charge of studying the scriptures. They were in charge of uh, expounding the scriptures to the general populace. And they were basically in charge of getting other people to understand what the prophecies were and what to look for and, and to be anticipating the Savior, okay? And, and they studied these things and, and I'm sure that they publicly prayed you know, for the Messiah to come and encouraged people to have him come. But when he came, what did they do? They rejected him and they looked, more than just rejected him, they looked for a way to dispose of him. And I use that word dispose as in throwing away like garbage. That's how they treated Jesus. They wanted to dispose of him. You know, Jesus called them hypocrites many, many times on several occasions in the Bible, and it's because that's exactly what they were in very many ways, you know. We're going to... We're going to look in, and again in the book of Mark, but before we do, I want to make sure we, we set the stage for what Jesus is doing, get to un understand, um, you know, the, the situation around it, just to, in a, a brief review as we've gone through um, the book of Mark and through chapter 11, and we're, we're dipping now into the beginning of chapter 12, and really I don't know that there should be a break there, you know, as far as chapters go, we, we understand that the, the chapter and verse breaks we're not in the originals, okay? That, that's not, they're not inspired. They're just there to help us to find stuff. So when I say, go to Mark chapter 12, everybody will be in the same spot. That's all the purpose that they have there. But many times when we look at punctuation and we look at the way, the way things are going, it would be best just to leave it go, okay? But um, at, at any rate, it's, it's up to us to study the scripture and to read it um, um, carefully and to see how that it, that it fits together. But to set the stage, we understand something here that, that Jesus is in his last week of in earthly ministry here, okay? We understand that at the beginning of this week, he rode into Jerusalem on the colt of a donkey, and we looked at, at how that donkey had never been ridden before, and donkeys are... People think that they're stubborn. Um, they're really just kind of set in their ways, like a lot of people I know one's talking to you, <laughs> okay? But I, my, my point is, is that it, it was, as, as Jesus looked at this animal, this animal, I believe, understood who Jesus was. Jesus talks about the rocks and the stones crying out, okay? Nature knows who he is, that he has created. It's too bad that the masterpiece of his creation, man, so often pretends, at least, not to recognize who he is. Classic example, the Pharisees the chief priests, the elders, and the scribes who we're looking at here. But we understand that, that Jesus came in at the beginning of this week into Jerusalem, and he did something that, that he'd, he'd never done before in that he allowed his followers to publicly give him accolades, a, a, as you will. And, and, you know, when they were saying Hosanna to the highest, which means save now, and, 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 and having a big to-do, about Jesus coming in, all right, and, and to do that publicly. And Jesus had never done that before. And he allows him to do that as it sets the stage for the different things that Jesus is going to do this week. The challenges that he is putting forward to the chief priests and the Pharisees and the scribes and the elders in that Jesus needs to die at the Passover. Now, they did not want him to do that, and we'll see that as, as we move through. We get to Mark chapter 14 and, and, and possibly in a couple of weeks, but we see that they did not want to do it on the feast days. But 
He's our Passover lamb. I explained that in a, a couple of weeks ago too, in, in that he, it, and that's what he, he needed to die at the Passover. And Jesus is getting ready to do that. We see that, that he, he went in, he cursed the fig tree. We looked at that. And we, we also see that, that he cleansed the temple. A couple of weeks ago, we looked at his, his cleansing of the temple. The fact that the, the priests and, and those in charge of this place that was designed and was designated to be a house of prayer for God, they were using it in other ways to make money and to merchandise. Jesus called it there when, when we looked at um, the passage in John, this was not the same instance. There was one at the beginning of his, his ministry, okay, where he doesn't, um, um, doesn't call them a den of thieves here. He says, you've made my house a house of merchandise. And they were doing the same thing there when we looked in, in this the second time, which is at the end of Jesus' ministry there in Mark chapter 11, that they were, they were buying and selling and, and so forth. And basically the problem was not so much that money was being exchanged, although that, that's wrong, that, 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 that part is wrong, but, it, but it's the whole idea was that they were using God's house for something it was not designed for. They were stealing the actual purpose of what it was for. People were cutting through, using it as a shortcut. Jesus says, no, you can't do that. All right, this is designed, it was set aside, set aside for the purpose of worshiping God, not for you to take, just treat it like it's nothing. When we set something aside for God, it's sanctified, set apart for His use. We better leave it for His use, all right, and recognize who that is. And, and, and I don't want to get back into, into that lesson or we end up being here for an hour, okay? But, but the, the point here is, is that, that, he, that He cleansed the temple, tipping over the, the money changers' tables and, and, the, and the seats of those that sold doves and telling people what they were doing was wrong, okay? We looked last week at the, the uh, again, the priests and the, the elders and the scribes and the Pharisees. They came to Jesus and they tried to set up for him a verbal trap. Where do you get your authority for what you do and what you say and doing these miracles? You know, and, and Jesus flipped that trap around and caught them in their own trap when he, he introduced the, the situation of what did you do with John the Baptist? Excuse me for a second here. But as we move now in, into uh, Mark chapter 12, okay, Jesus is speaking of them, and by the time he's done talking about them, a parable about them, they understand what he's saying here, okay, and they don't like it, all right? But so let's, let's take a look, and we're going to go look in Mark chapter 12, and we're going to read the first eight and a half verses, and, and there's a reason why I'm going to just do eight and a half verses. We will look at the other half of verse, and there's a couple more verses after that. But I want to get the, the first part in here first. I want to show you something, all right? Mark chapter 12. I hope you're there. Starting in verse 1, and it says, And he began to speak unto them by parables. A certain man planted a vineyard and set a hedge about it and digged a place for the wine fat and built a tower and let it out to husbandmen and went into a far country. And at the season he sent to the husbandmen a servant that he might receive from the husbandmen of the fruit of the vineyard. And they caught him and beat him and sent him away empty. And again he sent unto them another servant. And at him they cast stones and wounded him in the head and sent him away shamefully handled. And again he sent another and they killed him. And, or, and him they killed and many others beating some and killing some. Having yet therefore one son, his well-beloved, he sent him also last unto them, saying, They will reverence my son. But those husbandmen said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance shall be ours. And they took him, and killed him, and cast him out of the vineyard. What shall therefore the Lord of the vineyard do? There's the question that Jesus poses to these Pharisees, scribes, elders, and chief priests, all right? Now, we need to understand, before we get, get to that question, we need to understand a few things regarding um, the Jewish laws and so forth and, and, and what is happening here, okay? And, and uh, in order to understand that, I want you to take your Bibles and let's go back to the book of Leviticus, all right? Leviticus chapter 19. And in Leviticus chapter 19, it, it, it talks about what to do, some of the laws regarding 
planting a vineyard, planting trees, plant, and so forth. Fruit trees, that is what, was what I believe what it's talking about there. But at, at any rate, more focused on the vineyard here. So in Luke, or I'm sorry, Leviticus chapter 19, starting in verse number 23. And it says, And when ye shall come into the land, and shall have planted all manner of trees for food, then ye shall count the fruit thereof as uncircumcised three years, shall it be as uncircumcised unto you. It shall not be eaten of. So the first three years, not allowed to eat. But the fourth year, all the fruit thereof shall be holy to praise the Lord withal. So that's his. Verse 25. And in the fifth year shall ye eat of the fruit thereof, and it may yield unto you the increase thereof. I am the Lord your God. Okay, so he, he sets down a very um, specific thing. So we see here in, in, in Mark, okay, if you go back there to Mark chapter 12, we, we see here that they, they you plant the vineyard, and then he it, some time has passed, all right? After some, some things have happened, and, and, and some time has passed, and these first three years are passed, maybe the fourth, and then we're into the fifth year, whatever. He sends, he, so he's, he's planted this vineyard, he's made a tower, he's put in the wine fat area there of the wine press and, and so forth, and then he's lent it out to husbandmen so that these other people are going to take care of it for him. He's going to pay them and so forth, all right? But... We see what's, what's happened here is, is what would happen is, is that he sends his servants there because they have to collect. This is, this is part of the, the thing that I discovered as I was doing some studying on this. They had to collect some of the produce that, that it comes from there. And if they don't do that and, they just, and, and it just goes on and, and time passes on, he loses his, his right, the owner loses his right to that um, those vines and those and those trees and it becomes the property of the husbandman all right which explains why he keeps sending these servants all right in this parable we keep sending these servants to collect some of the fruit here in order to maintain his right of ownership okay but it also explains why the tenants refused to give some of the fruit to hold back that fruit was because they wanted it for themselves. They wanted the vineyard all to themselves, okay? Now, we get to this point here, all right? And we get to, just so you understand, they would have all understood these laws and would have understood what, what the reasoning is behind this and probably seen these situations or at least heard of these situations before. So we understand, they understand what's going on here, but just so we understand a little better, because whether, whether the, the Jews at this time were adhering to those laws of not eating the fruit for the first three years, four years, all right, I, I don't know. It doesn't, it doesn't tell us that, but um, they still understood the law, all right? And so then Jesus asked them that question there in verse 9, first part of verse 9. He says, what shall therefore the Lord of the vineyard do? Now, again, it's important for us to compare Scripture with Scripture, all right? And if this account that of, of Jesus telling this parable of the vineyard is in other places in the scripture, it's wise for us to read those passages as well. And it is. It's in Matthew and it's also in Luke. But in turn in your book, Bibles, please, to Matthew. Keep your finger in Mark. We're coming right back to Mark. We're all done with Leviticus. But keep your finger in Mark and come with me to Matthew chapter 21. Same situation, but a little more detail than we get here in Mark in this one specific spot. So in Matthew chapter 21, your finger's still in Mark, but Matthew chapter 21 and verse 41, after Jesus asks this question, what, and I'll read the question in Mark, what shall therefore the Lord of the vineyard do? And verse 41 of, verse of chapter 21, he says, they, unto, they say unto him, he will miserably destroy those wicked men and will let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen, which shall render their fruits in their season. So they get all mad. It, it re, kind of reminds me of, of David and Nathan. You know, when, when Nathan gives him the story about the, the, the traveler that comes and he's got the one little lamb and so forth, and, Dave, and, he, and the other guy who's rich, he's got all the different lambs, and the guy needs a little bit of food. The, the rich guy goes and takes the one lamb, you remember, from, from, the, from the poor guy, and he kills him, and he says, what, what shall I do? And David just loses it. And he says, that guy's, you know, we're, we're going to kill him, and he's going to have to pay back four times. You know? But... Uh, it reminds me of this here, okay? Because here Jesus asks them the question, what shall happen to these husbandmen? And they lose it, okay? They, well, he, they, should, they should kill him, you know, and, and give, it, give it to somebody else. 
Now come back to Mark, okay? Keep your finger there in Matthew too, because we'll come back to Matthew. If I told you too late, you're gonna have to find it again. But come back to Mark, okay? Because we see here there's something in Mark that's not in Matthew, where Jesus now repeats the same thing, okay? Verse nine, part B, okay? He says, he will come and they'll destroy the husbandman and will give the vineyard unto others. You know what's happening here? Jesus is now repeating this verdict, but this verdict of judgment is on the Pharisees, the chief priests, the elders, and the scribes. Because then he goes on and he talks a little bit more. We miss, we miss that part in Matthew, but we pick it up in Mark, all right? One is not contradicting the other one. One is adding to the other one so that we can get the whole picture. So after these men lose it and say, well, we, we need, they, they should kill these guys, Jesus repeats the verdict. But now the verdict is pointed at them, and he continues, okay? Now flip back to Mar Matthew again, because now we, we, we pick up where this is left off after Jesus repeats the verdict, okay? And he says, actually, um... Go back to Mark. <laughs> keep your finger there in Matthew, but keep going back, going back to Mark. So let me, let me finish this, this train of thought that Jesus has. I'm sorry. But he says, He will come and destroy the husbandman and will give the vineyard unto others. And have ye not read this scripture? The stone which the builders rejected is become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Okay. We see here that this judgment is there. All right, on these guys. Now, like, let's, let's read what's, what's in to get the whole picture. Let's go back to Matthew for a second here. In Matthew 21, verse 43, he says, Therefore say I unto you. Okay, so he, he, said, he talks about this, all right? And I might have got this backwards here. I think I got to get this backwards. But anyway, read, read this. let's read this here, what Jesus says. Therefore say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. Okay, now what, what I want you to understand something here. As, as we look at this, this um, parable, and as he turns the parable back on them, therefore I say unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. Now he turns it around and he, and he points out that, you know what? You are the husbandman. And then it, then it becomes clear what he's talking about. We understand, okay, if, keep your finger there in, in Mark. We'll be coming back there, like I promised. But I want you to come with me to Isaiah chapter 5. Isaiah chapter 5. This is also very common knowledge among these men. They would understand this, but, but somehow or other, they missed it right off the bat when Jesus was telling the parable. But now it becomes very clear as to who is the vineyard, okay? The vineyard is the nation of Israel. And I'll show you that as, as they read this very familiar passage to them. Isaiah chapter 5, verses 1 to 7, it says, Now will I sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved touching his vineyard. My well-beloved hath a vineyard in a very fruitful hill. And he fenced it and gathered up out the stones thereof and planted it with the choicest vine and built a tower in the midst of it and also made a wine press therein. And he looked that it should bring forth grapes and it brought forth wild grapes. See how close this is to what Jesus' parable is? Talking about the tower, talking about the wine press. Verse 3, And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge, I pray you, betwixt me and my vineyard. What could have been done more to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Wherefore, when, ye, when I looked that it should bring forth grapes, brought it forth wild grapes? And now go to, I will tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will take away the heads thereof, and it shall be eaten up, and break down the wall thereof, and it shall be trodden down, and I will lay it waste. It shall not be pruned nor digged, but there shall come up briars and thorns. I will also command the clouds that they rain no rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. Now here, he's, here in, in Isaiah, he is condemning Israel and, and pronouncing a judgment upon Israel. Okay, But we see here very clearly that what he's talking about is the vineyard is the house of Israel. Okay, And the, the men of Judah, his pleasant plant, 
And he looked for judgment, but behold, oppression for righteousness, but behold, a cry. All right. So the point is, we, we understand here that it's becoming very clear to these people. The vineyard is Israel. And now it's blatantly obvious to them, as Jesus is pointing it out. You know who the owner is? Same owner here in, in Isaiah. The owner is God. This is my vineyard. All right. The servants are his prophets. Those prophets that have come. And guess who the son is in Jesus' parable? The son is Jesus, the son of God. And these, these men understand what they're saying. And these, the only people left are the husbandmen. And you know what that is? That is the chief priests and the elders and the scribes. And yes, the Pharisees. The Pharisees aren't mentioned here in Mark, but they are mentioned in, um, in the passage in Matthew, that they are there and, and, and part of their reaction. And it talks about the Pharisees, all right? We talk about the prophets that, that were rejected. The most recent prophet that was rejected, was rejected in their lifetime. As a matter of fact, Jesus just talked about him. Just talked about John the Baptist, okay? He just finished posing that question to them. Who is John the Baptist? Was he from God or was he from man? Was he a prophet? Okay, and, and, and so forth. You know, this group of men, the scribes and the Pharisees and the chief priests and the elders, they wanted that vineyard all for themselves, just like the husbandmen here in Mark chapter 12 that Jesus is talking about in his parable. We see later in the book of John chapter 11 and verse 48, just jot this, this reference down. I have made mention of this verse before in, in, in our study. It says with, with, what they are talking amongst themselves and speaking of Jesus, and they say, if we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him and the Romans shall come and take away both our place and nation. They were worried about losing their position. And Jesus was threatening that, that they would lose their position because the Messiah has come. What need do they have of the other priests when the Messiah is there? Well, we don't want him. We want to protect our spot, okay? And that's what they were concerned of. But who is this nation? When we look there in, in, in Matthew 21, verse 43, I don't know if your fingers, I've got your fingers in about four places in the Bible there. We're done with Isaiah, okay? Just need them in the two, Matthew and Mark. But in Matthew chapter 21 and verse 43, he says, Therefore say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. Who is or what is that nation that Jesus is talking about? Well, it, 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 I, want, I want to show you something here. There's another verse in Exodus chapter 19. We are going to look at a couple other verses here. You, you can just follow along as I read them to you or jot them down, or you're welcome to, to look them up yourself. But in Exodus chapter 19 and verse 6, it says, and he is God speaking to them, and it says, and ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests. These guys were, okay? But and ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. They were supposed to be a holy nation, but these guys had failed dramatically in what, what they had done here. They had historically rejected Jesus' God's prophets, okay? We see that they had personally, not only historically, but they had personally rejected God's prophets. They didn't want anything to do with John the Baptist. They didn't want anything to do, Jesus is not a prophet, okay? But they, want, they didn't want anything to do with the actual Messiah either. But they, they had historically turned their backs on these people, okay? But more importantly, like I said, they had rejected the Son, all right? As it speaks of in, in Jesus' parable. And even in the face of being, this is, this is bold, in the face of being confronted by Jesus as to where their flaws are, what did they want to do? Let's still get rid of them. Let's not turn, like, let's not turn around and do what's right. Man, we're, we're sorry, God, you're right in front of us. No, they're still blinded to the truth. And, and they, they still reject who Jesus is. They just dig their heels in. I don't care if I'm wrong. I'm staying wrong because it holds my spot, okay? And they remained in rejection of him. But who is this replacement nation? As we see there in, in uh, Exodus 19, verse 6, you know, that Israel, with, under the leadership of the priests and so forth, were supposed to be the holy nation, which they failed drastically on. But Jesus says there's a, rep there's a, a replacement nation coming, a holy nation. In 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. I'll give you a second to find that because it's one of those tiny little books at the end. 
But in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9, it's a familiar verse, but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, what? An holy nation, a peculiar people that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You know what that holy nation is? It's his church. It's his church church was set up to do that all right and then and then we see that as, as we as we're still looking at that that passage there when it when it talks about in Matthew chapter uh, 21 okay when it when it says let me read those verses again therefore say I unto you the kingdom of God shall be taken from you these rotten priests and leave uh, uh, scribes and Pharisees and so forth and given to a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof and whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken, but on whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind him to powder. What stone? What stone? Verse 10. We're back in Mark. Here we go. Okay. And have ye not read this scripture? The stone which the builders rejected is become the head of the corner. This, is, this was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. The stone... The stone is Jesus. Verse, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 20 says, And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. What did these priests and these Pharisees, what did they do? What did they do? Still there in Mark chapter 12. I'm going to finish this passage is verse 12. And they sought to lay hand a hold on him, but feared the people, for they knew that he had spoken the parable against them, and they left him and went their way. They understood that Jesus was talking about them. All right. They didn't want to repent. You know, what, what application can, can we take from this passage? Are, are you priests? Are you Pharisees? I hope not. <laughs> okay. But what application can we take from this passage? You know, we looked last week at mentioned one other Pharisee and one that one other Pharisee's name was Nicodemus you know Nicodemus was not the same as the rest of the Pharisees now were there more like Nicodemus it, it's it's quite possible there may have been one or two more um, but clearly if there was more they were a very very small number because Jesus just condemns the Pharisees in a, in a blanket statement but he's not condemning Nicodemus okay you know the, the point is this I think that there were some that were genuinely searching for the Messiah. Nicodemus, for sure, was generally or, or genuinely searching for the Messiah. But clearly, most of the others were not. They were more interested in what they appeared to be than what they actually were. That's why Jesus called them hypocrites, okay? They knew it was important to be searching for and anticipating the Messiah. And they wanted others to see them as having devoted their lives to this pure pursuit of looking forward to, for the Messiah. But how many of them were genuine? Nicodemus for sure, and maybe a couple more. The Bible doesn't tell us, maybe not. Maybe it was only Nicodemus. But these men studied the scriptures. They knew the prophecies. The, they, they all said the right things. They all appeared, it's important to say appeared, to be doing the right things and to follow what the, the expected rules were. But how flexible were their hearts? Not at all. Being confronted point blank by Jesus, they still dug in their heels and thought, we've got to get rid of this guy. You know, brings me back to my one illustration that I began at the beginning, a little quote there. You know, the trouble with good advice is it usually interferes with your plans. Well, the trouble with, with good teaching, what if, what if Jesus' good teaching got in the way of their good plans? Well, it apparently did, you know. What if Jesus' good, good teaching and, and the teaching of the Bible gets in the way of our good plans? You know, I was, I was, I was in a discussion with somebody this week, and this verse came up, and it, and it just tied right into it, to what we're looking at here. And I want you to... To, to take your Bibles and, and come with me. We're all, we're all done in Mark. We're all done in, uh, yeah, we're all done everywhere except for this one, one, two little verses that I want you to look at. And it's in, in Psalm chapter 
139. There is so much beautiful stuff in the book of Psalms. Most of the Psalms being written by David. There were some that were written by Moses. There were some that was written by Asaph and, and I believe a couple of other writers that, that did some things in, in the book of Psalms. But in Psalm 139, it's a beautiful chapter, but it's a Psalm of David. And he says this, he says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way of everlasting. I want you to understand something. This verse is not saying, it's not David saying, I know that I'm doing everything right. Go ahead and, and check it out and see for yourself. That's not what David is saying, okay? He's not you know, saying, search me, O God, and know my heart. And see if there be any wicked way in me. No, there's, no, there's no wicked way in me. That's not what David is saying, okay? What David is saying is, I don't know if there's something that I'm doing that's wrong or not. Show me what it is if there's something that I'm doing that's wrong so that I can change to be like you. That's what David is saying. Show me what it is that I can't see myself that I am doing that's wrong. This ought to be our earnest prayer. You know, Here's where it comes with, with that trouble. You know, the, the trouble with good advice is that it usually interferes with our plans. You know, what do we do if God points out something where we need to change? What do we do? God pointed out to the Pharisees and the, high, the chief priests and the elders and the scribes. He pointed out to them and they dug their heels in and said, I don't care. I don't care. You're gonna ruin my life. I'm gonna lose my position you know, or, or whatever, but they, they didn't care, okay? What do you do? What do I do when God points out something that we need to change? You know, do we, do we rationalize why it's okay at this stage of my life or in this day and age in order to do whatever this is or not do whatever this is? Do we weigh the pros and the cons of making a change rather than just making the change? You know, I firmly believe that when we harden our hearts to something that God has tried to convict us on, we halt our spiritual growth. You know, God is not going to give us a list and say, hey, Taylor, here's 47 things that you need to fix. There is probably at least 47 things that I need to fix. But he's not going to give me all 47 at once. It would be too overwhelming. He's going to give me one or two. But if I say I'm not going to fix that one, he's not going to give me another one. He's not going to give me another one. And I'll halt my spiritual growth by digging in my heels on whatever God has pointed out to me that I, that I should be changing. You know, what we need to do is we need to plead like David here. And, then, and, and go ahead and read that whole chapter when, when this video is over, you know, in another couple of minutes of, of, of Psalm 139. But we need to make this prayer. We need to plead this prayer with David. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if, right, right down to my thoughts, not just what I do, but what I'm thinking, not even just, just my motives, but right down to what I'm thinking, why I think what I think. Know my, know my thoughts and see if there be any, any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Take me out, show me how to get out of that so that I can be what you want me to be in that way of everlasting. Go to God with that prayer. Confess to him if you have halted your spiritual growth and ask him to please show me again what you need me to change and open your heart to God.